Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in Gen Z's technology series of webinars, Protocol-Based Abstraction of Fabric-Attached Endpoints. We'll be getting started in just a moment, about two minutes past the hour. Uh, we'll allow a few more folks to join. And if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please be sure to use the questions from audience option in the right-hand side of your screen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in our Gen Z technical webinar series, Protocol-Based Abstraction of Fabric-Attached Endpoints. Our presenter today is going to be Greg Casey. He's an engineer at Dell EMC working in the CTO office. Hello, Greg. Hello, Rachel. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Greg Casey. I'm an engineer at EMC, Dell EMC. I work in the CTO office where I focus on Gen Z and how it may be applied to our server architectures. The goal of this webinar is to provide an understanding of Gen Z endpoints in the context of overall Gen Z technology. Additionally, I want to challenge the attendees on how compute systems can take advantage of Gen Z technology and solve disaggregated compute problems. First, let's have an overview of what a Gen Z is and its characteristics. It's high performance. Gen Z is a high performance network. High bandwidth, low latency. It's very scalable. Eliminates protocol translations, both in cost and the latencies. It eliminates software complexities, overhead and latencies. How does it do this? That is what we're going to talk about during this presentation. It's reliable. No stranded resource or single points of failure. There's no restricted topologies, no required topologies. Therefore, traffic can pass trouble, bypass trouble areas of failed components. It allows for multiple storage elements to contribute to a solution for a performance of high availability. Kind of similar to how disk drives participate in a RAID. Therefore, this allows for flawless operation in spite of individual component failures or paths. It has security, hardware enforced security. It's flexible. Shown here in this diagram is a Gen Z fabric, but it could be a mesh, a daisy chain. The topology is totally arbitrary. It's compatible. Gen Z has an existing, uses existing physical layers from both PCIe, internal to the box, and IEEE 802.3 at the file level, for uh, which comes from the Ethernet world. Significant work has been undertaken within the Gen Z consortium to reduce for error correction impact upon latency. Economic benefits to the customer, sharing of resources in a fabric situation, putting memories, GPUs, FPJs, and other valuable costly resources in a reconfiguration and reusable pool. So if they are not being used by one application, they can be reallocated and used by a different computer or a different application. The obvious advantage of not having to buy something for every compute node is obvious.
Jan's view is conceptually a memory-centric architecture. What do I mean by memory-centric? Rather than having the compute element centralized, the Gen Z of Fabrica allows the data itself to be centralized. In this way, new compute resources can be added to or pointed, can be pointed to the data. Today, in our systems, considerable amount of compute power is consumed by needless movement of interim data around the network. Gen Z allows for the manipulation of the data in place. Gen Z uses memory semantic read-write protocol. That enables multiple component types to effectively communicate. Component uh, types include processors, memory, storage, I.O., FPJ, GPUs, and so forth. This universal communication protocol simplifies component design. It has increased bandwidth. We talked earlier about using PCIe, and we're using Gen 4 PCIe. That'd be 400 gigabits, uh, gigabytes per second. If we're using 802.3 and we, from the OIF, and we're using the 112 giga transfer PAM4, that'd be 1.4 terabytes of communication bandwidth. As I said earlier, low latency is a driving force within Gen Z. But latency, capacity, and distance are all naturally competing forces. Gen Z is specifically designed to achieve the lowest latency, still remain still with the goal of having high capacity. Gen Z packet format is specifically designed for quick switching, which leads to low latency. Open innovation. Because it is an open standard, uh, it allows for open innovation. It enables independent innovations both at the requester and the responder. The syntax itself is architected to allow innovation for maximum performance within memory compute and methods for direct in-memory data manipulation and data and reduction of data movements throughout the system. It can be architected highly available because of the arbitrary Gen Z topology. Packet protection covered by CRCs, sequence numbering, timeouts, multiple other techniques. Memory RAS is also covered with error detection codes, memory scr media scrubbing, and media sparing. Security, Gen Z has aspects that protect the system from malicious component threats, packet eavesdropping, destruction and modification, denial of service attacks, destruction of in-flight packets, or extreme packet injections, or unauthorized packet injections. Ingress and egress access keys, page region keys, request responder component destination tables, and switch relay tables are the mechanisms that are used to uh, facilitate the security. Gen Z is a requester responder model. The component, a component is the term Gen Z uses to describe a requester or responder, or it can be both of them as well. The role a component plays within a solution depends on how an operation is supported. For example, if a component that generates a read or write request packets and then receives the corresponding response packets, well, that's the requester role. Obviously, this would be CPUs or GPUs or traditional processing units. But a requester can also be a smart endpoint that does specific processing. A component that receives and executes reader write request packets and generates the corresponding response plays the role of the, res the responder role. Obviously, this is traditional memory, but it could also be a CPU that could be queried or responded to because somebody needs some data that the CPU has in its, in its stores. Gen Z enables a wide spectrum of endpoints. And as stated, it allows components to be requesters and or responders, equal footing for future architectures. Also stated as before, it is the cement memory semantic load store. It has a higher level of abstraction in the protocol, un hides underlying endpoint complexities. We'll get into that a little bit later. The basic mandatory thing it has to do is it has to do reads and writes so everyone can talk. 
It has specific optional classes of requests, which Gen Z call op classes, and we'll be discussing some of those later. For context and review, let's look back at a typical DDR DRAM interface. There's nothing new in this diagram. There's RAS, there's CAS, there's Write Enable, there's Strobe. And of course, the specific timing of each is based on the chips that are on that particular DIM. The system has to be aware of the specifics of the memory being serviced, the refresh timings, the number of configured ranks and pages, page sizes, the burst operations, the pre-charge that has to happen. From a system design point or the motherboard, system designers have to be concerned with the complete logical and physical placement of these DIMMs, which are complicated by the number of DIMMs per controller, the clock distribution to the DIMMs, the single-ended nature of the data and address buses into a DIMM, and the impact on electrical noise and signal integrity, lane skew, and large DIMM footprint approaching 300 pins. Through the reading of the FBD, for clues of the nature of the DIMM, the control and setting of each DIMM via BIOS and the testing of these known configurations, DRAMs themselves are not all the same. Each has some unique characteristics. But with the advent of alternate storage class memories, these characteristics will grow. This is what I refer to as memory care and feeding. So how does Gen Z try to address this problem? This slide is a simple animation we try to illustrate the Gen Z memory interface. Today's processors are aware of the specific type of memory and is attached to all memory controllers. The processor has a section in it which performs the care and feeding of those DRAMs as indicated previously. Gen Z moves this function of the media controller from the processor and puts it in the media module. This allows the care and feeding of the memory to occur at the endpoint, allowing the processor to universally issue reads and writes without regard to the underlying memory construction. Gen Z contributes to the reliability, availability, and serviceability of overall systems. With arbitrary topologies, multi-pathing, multi-lane, much higher system availability should be attainable. This diagram shows three topologies. On the left, we have a daisy chain. The SOC is trying to talk to components B and C, utilizing a daisy chain through components, through components, whoops, excuse me, I'm sorry. The lower diagram asserts a failure that the link to component B has failed. Traffic is redirected through component C using the daisy chain technology. The middle diagram is a multi-link, multi-lane communication between the SOC and the component. The X there indicates that one of the lanes has uh, been broken, some defect, and the Gen Z communication remaps the communication from the remaining lanes. The third diagram on the right shows multipath where the FOC and component both have two ports, feeding two separate Gen Z switches. The lower illustrates the failure of a switch or something else in the lower link. The traffic is rerouted to the remaining path. Security, there's a number of things that are built in. Access keys. This is where component A and component C is allowed but component B and component C cannot talk. So component C has the ability through keys to restrict who can talk to and who can't. Region keys. This is an example where component A and component B can talk to component C, but only defined by the region areas that are set up by the region keys. Cryptographic authentication is important and shows how crypto sign packet can be denied by a component if the keys do not satisfy the authentication testing. 
auto anti-replay methods are employed in Gen Z protocol to protect from the in the middle situation. This is a very important area of Gen Z. Further reading is available on the Gen Z website, and a webinar was previously given a couple of months ago on the subject and is available on the website. Gen Z has developed some demonstration vehicles that have been part of some of the recent trade shows, including Supercomputer 2019. On the left, you see a media box, which was a two -year, or is a two-u chassis, which has been envisioned and demonstrated as a media box. It has an internal Gen Z expander switch, but no processing. It is a true memory appliance. It supports up to six, what we call ZMMs or Gen Z media modules. It has an FPGA 12-port uh, by four-lane expander switch. It has four four-lane QSFPs that can, can connect up to four servers, and was demonstrated with external Gen Z switching at the trade show. On the right, you can see a Gen Z memory media module. The media module is byte and block addressable. It has those access and region keys we talked about earlier. Its communication is four times four lanes of Gen Z running at uh, 25 giga, uh, gig per second. It has you know, right command collision detection. It does media scrubbing. And it has background ETC detection and correction. This diagram shows the rack that was demonstrated at Supercompute. As you can see, it has six servers uh, from different vendors across the top that were communicating through some PCIe to Gen Z bridges. There in the middle, you'll see a 2U dedicated chassis-based FPGA 12-port switch. There were three media boxes that could have contained up to 18 ZMMs. There were also two boxes to the lower right that were doing in-memory compute. One of them was provided by SK Hynix, and the other was developed and provided by Samsung, and was presented by the, their teams at the show. Now let's dive into the packet format of Gen Z. Shown as an example of a request packet. This particular packet is from a Core 64 op class and is a read request op code. Let's look at it. Simply stated, this is a packet originating from a request that wants to read a location. The packet obviously needs to contain the component information, what device has the information, and it also has to have the address of where that data exists. Let's look a little deeper into the fields that are in the uh, packet. You'll see one labeled PCRC, which is a prelude CRC code. This protects selected fields in the first four bytes. It protects uh, both the type and the length. There's also an ECRC. This CRC is used to validate the integrity of the entire end-to-end -end packet. I would like at this time to call the attention to the destination or DCID, destination component ID in the diagram. It's all contained in the first four bytes of the packet. This is significant because it allows the Gen Z switching entities to do very quick, very early address detection and make the correct switching decisions. You'll see something called SCID, which is the source component ID. This is included to inform the responder who is making the request response, which allows the correct generation and formulation of the response packet. Obviously, it needs to know who sent the answer back to. There's a tag field that coordinates the relationship between the requested packet and the associated response packet. There's a VC field. Gen Z has 32 virtual channels. 
As we talked earlier, the OTL and OPCODE, or OTL stands for OPCLASS, OPCLASS is to indicate the family of commands. Uh, and there will be a detailed slide on this later. And then the OPCODE is the specific Gen Z OPCODE, which is part of that OPCLASS. This particular packet is a read request. The read size is obvious. It's the number of bytes that are to be read. There's some special flags that we have here for special handling. LP, which is a logical PCI device. There's also a GC flag for multi-net and several others. There's a congestion field used for packet deadline, uh, deadline value to track packet age. There's a forward progress screen. Is used to ensure the application's forward progress in face of activity that could otherwise result in resource starvation or live lock, non-deterministic forward processing in the fabric, i.e., something got stuck and we need to flush that packet out of the system. The destination, this is the response to that request that we just had. So the destination and responding component will issue the command of the request and formulate a response to the packet. This slide is, again, the packet format is a core 64, which is the op class. And the read response itself is an opcode. So it responds with that opcode. The structure is very similar to the packet that just came to the device, which is expected. This is just another Gen Z packet, which must have all the mechanisms to successfully transit itself back across the Gen Z fabric to the requester. Obviously, the DCD or the destination ID, in this case, it is now the SID because it's turned around and going the other way. There are some specific response packet fields that we should talk about. There's the read response reason code. That's a four-bit code that details the reason what are the results of what happened at the, at the request? Well, could be, ah, oh, the request happened, there's no errors in it. Uh, the data could be corrected, you, and there's a warning saying it's corrected data. Or we couldn't, we have an unrecoverable error, and so that'll be indicated. Or uh, days in, uh, poison data could be flagged. There's also an MS field. MS is for meta, metadata. Uh, indicates whether metadata associated with the actual data is being included. This field is not always present. Uh, this field indicates that it's not present, the metadata, or it's 32 bits long, or it's 64 bits long. And of course, the response packet really has to include both the metadata and the payload data where appropriate, which is actually the actual goal of, that the requester had in the first place. So this is the request. This is the response going back to the requester with the data. So I talked earlier about op classes, and Gen Z has the concept of a, a command family, and Gen Z calls this an op class. This diagram shows the different families of commands available in Gen Z. The Core 64 is the basic set of commands for a fabric-based Gen Z topology which all the, with, with this op class is required. Others are optional and negotiated between requesters and responders. The following slides touch on each of these optional op classes. Atomic, the first Gen Z optional class is very interesting. The command in this class may optionally be atomic. Some specific actions among multiprocessor processors of threads rely on atomic operations. So that's why this op class provides this. This specific op class allows for logical abstractions moving work to the endpoint and offloading the CPU from the required execution and data fetching. It can operate on scalar values and vector operands. From the description on this slide, these op codes are fairly obvious. But let's illustrate one of these op codes, the load min command. It supplies an address to the responder, address range to the responder. The responder does a search and responds with the minimum value it found. It's quite simple, but it's really powerful from the perspective of the requester. Flexible operand sizes and flexible vector sizes are supported. 
Collectives is the next op, optional op class. Uh, Gen Z has a protocol syntax which enables multiple machines to cooperate on a common problem. I'm going to run through the motivation of this, these op codes from this collective op class. A barrier collective serves, serves an application as a synchronization point. All application instances participating in the collection group are instructed by the collective initiator to reach a barrier before proceeding. A broadcast opcode is part of the collect is a collective. It serves to disseminate information from an application instance to all other application instances participating in this collective group. A scatter collective enables an application instance to distribute a data set to all other instances participating in that collective group. There's a gather. It collects and enables an application instance to collect data from multiple applications and co consolidate that data into a single contiguous data set. There's also several others, which I won't go into every detail of it, but it's available on the Gen Z sites, and there's a special training uh, uh, white paper on this subject. Large data movement, buffers. An op class that enables moving large amounts of data with very little CPU or CPU or requester intervention. This diagram on, on this slide illustrates three types of buffer movement. The top left, data buffers could be in the requester and in the responder. The bottom left, the data could, be, uh, could both be in the destination component. Or on the right, the data buffers could be in separate components. This diagram also illustrates the case of vectors of buffers. Well, for data movements are referred to as puts and gets. A put writes buffer, writes buffer A to buffer B. A get request reads from buffer B and to A. Vector requests are used to scatter the contents of one buffer across multiple buffers or to gather multiple buffers into one buffer. The key motivation of the, this Gen Z op class is to offload and minimize application software involvement in these large data movements. Precise time handling is another op class within Gen Z. And it, this is an example of a specialized op class that could enable specific types of capabilities. Precision time is a mechanism based on IEEE 1588 to distribute a common master time value among a set of components. This set of components we refer to as a precision time domain, or PTD. There are three types of components that we will be talking to. There's a GTC, which is the grand master time component, and it acts as the primary reference in the PTD. And this grand master time component can be initialized at power up or synchronized with some external time source, some international atomic clock, for example. There are FTZ, FTC, which are the slave time components, which only act as requesters of the time. Uh, they, don't, they just use it. So they're like weak components, such as a processor, an I.O. device, or some memory that needs to know that. There are also BTCs, or boundary time components, and a BTC acts as a time requester, and a time responder. In general, this is thought and, uh, as a place where we have to distribute the time, and we envision it in Gen Z switches. Pattern requests. Gen Z has an op class called advanced and has some very powerful commands, some of which are called pattern requests. Gen Z allows a requester to issue a command that sets up a pattern using regular expressions, and accomplishes a pattern count across a specific address range, or accomplishes a pattern match across some specific address range. 
So rather than having the requester drag all the data across the network and do the comparison, and for a single answer, it just sends the pattern it wants to match upon or count upon to the end device, and then the end device can do the computation and send back just the answer. GEMD is also designed to deliver messaging where app-to-app -app latency is critical. It's high performance, very low latency, high bandwidth. Hardware is driven multipath for high bandwidth and resiliency, minimal degradation performance in the event of failures. We talked about that earlier. No redundant drivers or multipath software is required. Advanced switching facilitates messaging for enclosure and rack scale solutions. We reduce jitter and enables congestion avoidance using those 32 virtual channels we talked about. Security with authentication and features that protect and isolate infrastructure messaging resources. Lightweight notification protocol is used by a component to register an interest in one or more fixed size blocks in another component and later be notified when the data, the LN block, is updated. Notification provide a lightweight signaling mechanism to reduce software complexity, overhead, and synchronization costs. Strong order domain is a logical construct used to delineate individual packet flows and provide reliable delivery and to enforce strong packet ordering. SODs can be established between multiple components. This enables third-party protocols to be tunneled across Gen Z, where ordering is important. The next two slides, I'll talk to the ability with Gen Z to accomplish PCIe-related functionality. The first is a logical PCIe device, LPD. This drawing depicts an example of Gen Z that contains both a Gen Z and a PCIe I.O. components. LPDs enable immediate support of Gen Z components by unmodified OSs. Gen Z components with LPD can fully exploit the Gen Z fabric and its architecture. Gen Z's PCAM which stands for PCIe Enhanced Configuration Management Access Mechanism, is compatible with PCIe's ECAM mechanism, which supports device and functionality discovery, enumeration, and configuration. MMIO apertures are clever use of the existing ACPI mechanisms that could constrain MMIO mappings within specific ranges. A word of note, PCIe and Gen Z have fundamentally different ordering requirements. Notably, PCIe requires a fabric to do ordering enforcement while Gen Z does not. Remember back when we started that LP flag in the packet format? That flag is utilized to enforce ordering when in a PCIe uh, LPD mode. The second PCIe enabling Gen Z feature is the logical PCI hierarchy. This enables Gen Z components to attach a set of native PCIe devices to a host via the Gen Z fabric. This diagram shows an LPH bridging to a PCIe hierarchy with two PCIe root ports. There's another root complex with an integrated endpoint and an external PCIe switch with three external PCIe devices. LPH highly leverages the LPD mechanisms and concepts, but it represents a native PCIe hierarchy, not an LPD endpoint. Maybe more simply stated, this allows us to establish a remote PCIe root port complex that can be utilized across a Gen Z switching fabric. Gen Z also allows you to roll your own, as I'd like to say, with your own op classes or vendor-defined op, class, uh, op codes. 
Then, uh, vendor defined packets enable components to customize communication while ensuring basic interoperability at the component and packet relay levels. It supports 32 of these vendor, vendor type requests and 32 vendor defined responses. This is a list of all the currently released specifications and are currently available on the GenZConsortium.org website. To gain industry support and facilitate innovation across the industry, many Gen Z documents have been authored and donated to SFF, which is part of the SNE organization. I said earlier in several other slides that there's lots of educational material that we have on the Gen Z website. And I'd like to put this slide up to illustrate that. There's detailed training material which do a lot uh, deeper dive on all of these subject areas. And uh, it continues to be added to. The Gen Z team has put together numerous white papers. This is the current list of our white papers that are available on the website. Uh, more being added. Uh, again, that's genzconsortium.org. We currently have over 60 members in the Gen Z Consortium. And this is a list of those companies. I guess we're at the point now, Rachel, do we have any questions? Hi, Greg. Yes, we actually have a few questions. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the first question is, can you elaborate on memory semantics from a software OS perspective, Gen Z attached to MMU versus PCIe attached to IO MMU? Sure. That's a very good question. The uh, uh, memory semantic refers to for basic load store. Where you think of Ethernet where you have a, a, a packet that communicates and has a whole TCP IP or some underlying packet structure uh, that has to have several hundred or even thousands of instructions, which we call a communication stack, to uh, pass that information across. Gen Z is really fundamentally a hardware structure which does direct loads and stores across a network and facilitates that in very quick uh, non-software time but hardware time activities. Uh, I, think that, I think I answered that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, I believe, in reference to slide number eight, and it is, can the media be SRAM? Yes. Uh, I'm not going to go back to slide eight. But the media can be almost anything. And that, that, that's the key ingredient of Gen Z. And that, I hope that point comes across, that a responder can be constructed of, of DRAM, the, the current ZMMs that we were showing at our trade shows were Z, uh, DRAM based. But they could be SRAM. They could be uh, flash memory. They could be uh, storage class memories that go into the future. Uh, they can be any kinds of memory. They don't even have to be memory. They can be a compute element that uh, responds with an answer. An FPJ could be a responder that does some calculation in base and just responds back. So the, the goal or the, 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 the vision of Gen Z is to have be very agnostic to what that media is at the other end, remove the care and feeding of that other end from the process, and put that back out to that media controller so it has to do that. and so. It's totally arbitrary and up to the industry to come up with very innovative solutions of what kind of memory could be supported out there. But uh, protocol-wise, any memory could be supported. Okay. The next question is, um, how are the multiple links set up and when? Meaning, how does the app impact the link set, set up, if at all? Uh, the, 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 we'll start at the end. The, the application should not be aware of that at all. And so there would be um, mechanisms inside uh, controlling processes uh, that coordinate the setup of the links 
uh, just like you're not aware of when you go out to a, a, a disk drive, uh, how many lanes are actually on the SCSI protocol. There's there's the system would set those up, invoke them, and tear them down. Uh, we have a uh, working group within the consortium that uh, uh, is in this management, which is software that controls, sets up, and tears down these structures. The key is the applications really shouldn't even know about that. That's uh, part of the uh, trying to make the, the underlying structure invisible to the application. Um, while you were providing that response, we had another question, <clears throat> excuse me, come up, that um, is what is the latency guarantee across the media types? For example, if storage cap class memory is used, Okay, um, you're adding something in the middle. So you're gaining certain things that you're taking away from things. So latency is, is we know we're not going to uh, decrease latency. We're going to add something to it. And uh, so it's always been a case of trying to minimize that. Uh, we have design goals. Of course, that will be when silicon comes about, the realization of those design goals. But we don't want everything to be sub uh, one microsecond. Uh, more likely sub 500 nanoseconds uh, going across the fabric end to end. Uh, but, it did, but clearly that is adding time. But uh, hopefully because of the topology, because of the added capacities, and because of the uh, uh, types of media we could support, and also the ability to have smart endpoints that reduce the amount of uh, traffic required, uh, it would still would be a favorable situation. So our goal is to minimize the, the latency, but you're going to add something over the baseline DRAM or whatever uh, memory which could have been designed immediately close to the processor. So the concept of tiering memory across applications is probably going to have uh, a favor into the future where your applications might be broken into different stratas of memory use, where for fast memory be local, where other memories can have different uh, capacities and different uh, speed and latency characteristics. Okay, we have time for one last question, Greg. Um, okay. This is kind of a two-part question. So first, does Gen Z Fabric do Gen Z fabric switches perform an automatic discovery of topology? And two, do Gen Z switches support adaptive routing? Hmm. I don't know what adaptive routing is, so that, that, that I'll have to defer that to an expert. And I will ask the question and get back. If someone wants to send me an email sometime on that, I will get the answer back. I'm not sure I know what that is. So back to the, uh, other than the adaptive question, what was the other part of the question? Do Gen Z fabric switches perform an automatic discovery of topology? Uh, no, there's no walking of the fabric. Uh, so if you think of Gen Z as a collection of both hardware and software, then it would. There's, there's going to be agents that will have to set up those, set up the topology. Uh, set up the endpoints and, and do that. There's not uh, people that are PCI experts know about the discovery and enumeration path inside of the PCIe, but that relies on an endpoint, I mean a root complex, and uh, it all happens at power up. Gen Z is challenging that underpinning and saying, can things be added and subtracted in real time, which you'll have, a, have to have a process, uh, a coordination process or a management process or that will be coordinating those ads and subtracts of resources over time. So it's, it's different from PCIe in that standpoint uh, that their PCIe, the protocol or the switches, aren't discovering things necessarily by themselves, but will have to have some management agents to help set up and control and dispatch those control mechanisms. Very good question, though. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, and thank you for presenting today. Um, as far as the remainder of the questions go, any questions that we were unable to get to during the presentation, we will follow up via email with the responses to those questions. So do feel free to continue asking those. 
You can also go back and review this presentation. It will be um, available on demand following the presentation. And we'd like to encourage everyone to join us for our next webinar, which is taking place June 17th and will be the first in our ecosystem series. And the title of that webinar is Ensuring Reliable High-Speed Gen Z Link Initialization. And that will be presented by Gordon Getty and David Rogers from Teledyne McCroy. So once again, thank you so much, Greg, for your participation today and for this great presentation. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.